Well, hello, Concordia family and all those joining us from around the world. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Adam Countryman, and I'm the Director of Worship Arts right here at Concordia in San Antonio. I got to tell you, we have a great service in store today. We have some wonderful music, and we're continuing in our series called Numbers. Now, wherever you are and whoever you're with, we want you to participate with us in worship today. So say the prayers with us, sing out the songs, and we're going to have a great time as we worship together online. Jesus is the Lord of all, and so it's in his name that we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, even though Jesus is the Lord of all, we don't always treat him like he's our Lord. We go against his commands, and we don't listen to his ways, and yet this promise is ours. We have a loving Lord who, when we break his commands, always stands by ready to forgive us of our sins. And so we take a moment now to confess our sins before our Lord. I'd invite you to join me in a time of reflection and speak these words with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We take a moment of silence now to confess those sins that we're struggling with in our hearts. In Matthew 23, Jesus is having a conversation with the religious leaders of his day. And he talks to them how about even though they look great on the outside, they're actually spoiled with sin on the inside. And yet Jesus knows that on the inside, God can clean us up no matter how damaged and sinful and broken we are. That's the whole mission and message of Jesus, that Jesus has come to clean us from the inside so that we may be clean before God, so that we may stand righteous before him, and he does this by dying on a cross. Because of what Christ has done for you, your heart has been cleaned, your sin has been forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today is from the book of Numbers, chapter 20, beginning at verse 2. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and to Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and they said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock may drink. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. You know, Moses gets water from a rock for the Israelites, but he doesn't listen to God's instructions on how to do it. And so God has a punishment, a discipline for Moses because God wants what's best for Israel and he wants what's best for Moses. You know, he wants what's best for you and me too. That's what Christians have believed about God for two millennia now. And so we take a moment now to confess our faith in the God who truly desires what is best for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Say these words with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, here's a special message just for the kids from our Executive Director of Children's Ministries, Nicole Carmines. Hey everyone, I have some things I brought to show you today. One, I have a hammer, and two, I have a piece of wood with some nails. Now, a hammer, as you know, can be used to knock things like this. That's the head side. But you can also use a hammer with this side, and that's called the claw. And you use it to pull on things like this. Remove a nail. Now, a hammer is either a knocker or a puller, but it can't be both at the same time. And you know, people are a lot like a hammer. You have, you have some people that knock everything all the time. They complain about this and they complain about that and they can just never find anything good to talk about. Well then, you also have pullers. Pullers are people who are always positive, they're always looking for the good, and they're always looking to pull people together to work with them. You know, this reminds me of our Bible event. In Numbers, Aaron and Moses are out in the wilderness with all the Israelites, and everyone is grumbling, and they're all complaining. Everyone is frustrated, and they're unsure about just about everything. But you know what? Are they alone? No, they're not. God is with them, just like he's with us all the time. When things are going great, God is good and he is with us. 
when things feel like they're helpless and hopeless, you know what? God is good and He is with us. You know, school is getting ready to start back up. So which are you going to be? Are you going to be a knocker or are you going to be a puller? My hope and my prayer for you is that you will be a puller. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for sending Jesus. He is our Savior and He is your Son. Help me to be positive and content in all that I do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for streaming with us today and being a part of our family of faith. Thank you also for your generosity to this ministry. You know, it's because of support from people like you that we're able to get a message of hope out to the world. Now, if you'd like to give to Concordia's ministries today, there are a few different ways you can do that. First of all, you can just go to the website, concordia.cc, and give right there. If you have the Concordia app, you can give from the app as well. And by the way, if you don't have the Concordia app, now is the time to download it from your app store. It has all sorts of great stuff on there, our worship guide, our prayer guide, information about what's coming up. And you can give right from the app as well. Or if you prefer to give using a check, all you have to do is mail a check to the address that's right here on your screen. Now, we're a church that loves to pray, and we would be honored to be able to pray for you. If you have a prayer request, go to concordia.cc prayer, and you can send us your prayer request there. Or if you're in need of prayer right now, we have prayer partners standing by. They'd love to be able to pray with you. All you have to do is call the number that's right here on your screen. Speaking of prayer, how about we go to God in prayer together right now? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you also that even in uncertain times, you always walk with us. You always call us by name because you care so deeply for us that you sent Jesus to us. Heavenly Father, as these months of pandemic continue to wear on, we ask you to give those who lead us wisdom to lead us faithfully and well. Be with our first responders, be with our medical professionals, be with all of those who are on the front lines of this pandemic. Give them strength and give them wisdom to do the right things in the right situations. Heavenly Father, be with us. Give us strength, give us encouragement, and give us hope. We know that in the end, all of this belongs to you because we belong to you. And so we entrust ourselves to you knowing that your son loves us, and he came for us, and he died for us, and he rose for us. And so it's in his name that we pray, and now together we pray the prayer that he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Hey there, everybody. I am so glad that you are joining us for worship. I'm Pastor Paul, uh, and yes, I can actually say Pastor Paul because last weekend I was finally ordained. It's pretty exciting. Um, but, you know, if you accidentally call me Vicar Paul, uh, well, uh, I guess I just forgive you because that's what pastors do. Um, but today we are continuing right along in our series in the book of Numbers. And today we're at Numbers chapter 20. And here again we find Moses and Aaron and all the Israelites complaining about water. And, and as I was thinking about the story and reading it through, uh, I couldn't help but be reminded of an incident that happened in the 2006 World Cup Championship. Uh, it involved a guy named Zinedine Zidane. Now, if that name means nothing to you, I, I don't blame you, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But in case you don't know, here's basically what happened. So, so this guy Zidane, he was a really good soccer player. He was a French soccer player, and he actually came out of retirement to try and help his team, the French team, uh, go and win the, the World Cup in 2006. Uh, so even though he was back from retirement, he did not miss a beat. He was, he was right on track, and he actually ended up leading them to win the first round, the second round, quarterfinals, semifinals, and they got all the way to the championship game. And everything is going really great. Zidane is kind of leading the way still, but there's just one thing. Zidane had kind of an anger problem, or well, at least he did that game, because at some point, right sort of in the middle of the game, Zidane's walking by a defender from the other team, and the defender, he must have said something, uh, it really must have said something that just really got under Zidane's skin, and it was enough to cause Zidane to kind of stop, turn around, walk up to the guy, and headbutt him right in the chest. Now, if you're not very familiar with soccer, that is not a normal thing to do. Uh, you see, he kind of let his, his anger get the best of him. He, he kind of got carried away, you know, lost his cool. And the ref, of course, sees this and really has no choice but to eject Zidane from the game. So you see, all that work, all, that, all those uh, hard games leading up to this moment where they, they were on track to win the World Cup, all messed up. Because of one, one stupid mistake. One moment where Zidane couldn't keep it together. And, and he does something that, that he would go on to regret. You see, I think about that because as I was first reading this story, that's a lot of what I get from what happens with Moses. You see, Moses and Aaron, you know, right now, they're actually at the tail end of their time in the wilderness. The 40 years of wandering is almost over. And, but again, the Israelites do what they always do. They are complaining. And so, you know, Moses, he does what he should do as they're complaining that there's no water. He goes to the Lord. And the Lord gives them very specific instructions. Uh, pretty simple, though. God says, speak to this rock and water will flow out of it. Okay, Moses has his instructions. Okay, speak to the rock, water will flow out of it. So Moses takes his staff, he, he goes in front of the people, he's, he's near the rock, but everything was, was looking good, <laughs> but there's just one thing. Moses, kind of an anger problem, or at least he did that day, because instead of speaking to the rock, Moses speaks to the people, and he says, listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Sounds like he's really starting to get worked up. In fact, he gets so worked up that instead of speaking to the rock, he hits the rock with his staff. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but it was actually a big deal to God. That because Moses did not speak to the rock, uh, instead hitting the rock, God tells Moses that he will no longer be able to lead the people into the promised land. Now, what happened with, you know, Zidane in the World Cup, that was bad, but this seems way worse, way, way more monumental of, of, a, of a mistake, in my opinion. I mean, Moses has been working for pretty much 80 years to try and bring these people to the promised land. Forty of those years were spent wandering in the wilderness, and now he's finally there. He's, he's almost there. It's, it's practically in his hands, and he makes one mistake. He lets his anger get the best of him, and it's all taken away. 
Now, I, I just, I kind of had a hard time thinking about that because for me, it just seemed like that was a little bit too harsh of a, of a punishment from, from God for what Moses did. I mean, for one thing, it's not that crazy that Moses thought to, to hit the rock instead of speaking to it, especially because God actually told Moses to hit a rock about 40 years prior in, in a very similar situation. You may remember the story. It's from Exodus 17. I actually remember the story well because this was the text that the first sermon I ever preached here at Concordia. It was on this text. Uh, but Exodus 17, very similar scenario. You got Moses and the complaining Israelites, and God tells Moses to go to this rock and hit it with his staff. So then why, 40 years later, all of a sudden, you know, if Moses does that again, it's, it's the worst thing in the world and it's enough to keep him from the promised land. Again, I mean, I get he disobeyed, but that seems, that seems really extreme. Why, why did God have such a crazy punishment for something that really did not seem that big of a deal? But, you know, it does make us think, is that the way that God is? I mean, is that how God kind of looks at us and, and treats us when we mess up, when we make a mistake? I mean, if that's true, then I know I'm in trouble. I mean, I'm not exactly the angriest person around, but, you know, get me in front of a board game and uh, that's a different story. But again, I know that, you know, I've had my moments, you've had your moments, times where you kind of just get uh, caught up in things or, or you just sort of let peer pressure get the better of you and, and you lose your cool and you do something you regret. And, you know, we think that, that in those moments, that's when, when God would be, we'd be gracious and patient and loving. But here we see it seems like he responds to Moses' mistake with, with impatience and, and anger and just being completely unreasonable. So again, what, what kind of God do we have? Do we have one that is loving and gracious and here to, to sort of pick us back up when we, when we fall? Or is God really nothing more than like a divine referee who is watching to make sure that we're following all the rules and, and making all the right moves, but as soon as we mess up, we're out of the game? What kind of God do we have? What kind of God are we dealing with? But as we take a closer look at, at what happens in the story, we'll see that there's actually a lot more going on than it originally seems. In fact, Moses didn't just have sort of a, a moment of anger, a moment of weakness, but he had a problem that was actually a lot more serious. And, and we know this because of what God says to Moses after all this takes place. Okay, so, so going to verse 12, listen to what God says. It says, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust. Okay, because you did not trust. Notice he didn't say because you, you know, got angry for a second. He didn't say because you did not follow all the rules exactly as I laid them out. God says because you did not trust. Because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Because you did not trust. You see, what looked like maybe just like an innocent mistake, uh, just a little faux pas that, that Moses just, you know, let all the circumstances and all the stress get the better of him, it was actually much more serious than that. That really, uh, beneath that moment was, was a whole lot of distrust. That Moses was not trusting God. And if he couldn't trust God with this small thing, how could he trust God with the big things? So now I think it's important for us to see, okay, when we have those moments where it's not just a matter of, you know, one little slip up, but actually deep down, there's a lot more going on where, where actually we are having a hard time trusting God with, with things going on in our lives, even, even the small things. With those situations, what's our hope? What does God do? How does God respond to us? And for the rest of the message, I want to take a closer look at what exactly God does to, to sort of help us and to, 
not let our trust sort of be ruined, but to restore our trust. Okay, so there's two things that I really want us to focus on. Two things that God does when our trust wavers, okay? The first thing that God does when our trust wavers is that he disciplines us. Yeah, when our trust wavers, when our, when our faith falters, God disciplines us. Now, again, I should say right up front, I'm going along with the distinction between discipline and punishment. Because that's what we see in the story. And you may be familiar with that distinction too, that there is actually a big difference between discipline and punishment. And on the surface, they can both, you know, look pretty similar, but, but really they actually have very different goals. You see, with punishment, the goal is to condemn. But with discipline, the goal is to correct. And, and we're familiar with with this kind of distinction. We, we're familiar with discipline all the time. I mean, for instance, uh, we have a daughter. Her name is June, and she's 11 months old, cute as can be. Uh, but again, she's starting to learn some things, starting to become a little bit more mobile, and now we really sort of have to keep our eyes on her at all times. And when we set her on the bed, you know, she doesn't just sort of lay there like she used to. Now she wants to get up and crawl, and very often she'll want to crawl to the end of the bed and off the bed. Now, as parents, the loving thing to do is not just to let her crawl off the bed and get hurt, but instead to, to stop her and to pull her back and to try and show her that, no, you know what, you need to stay up here. If you fall off, you're going to get hurt. Now, if she cries, if she feels like we're stopping her from doing something that she wants, does it mean it's not loving? No, I mean, it's actually what is best for her. Or, Like when she finds something on the ground that she really has no business eating, but she then sort of looks at us right in the eyes and and starts bringing it closer, closer, ready to eat it. Are we going to do everything we can to try and grab it from her? I mean, of course we are. And is she going to cry? Is she going to feel like we're punishing her? It seems like it. But really, we're just trying to protect her. We're trying to respond in a way that's best for her. And and Scripture gets at this very clearly, too. There, there's a great passage from, from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. It says, My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by him, for the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and chastises every child whom he accepts. So, did God abandon Moses for what he did? No. I mean, actually, we'll see next week, they pretty much don't skip a beat. They pick off right where they left off, that Moses is back in good standing with God. And that just goes to show that, yes, God had to discipline him, but it was so that their relationship would remain intact. And maybe it wouldn't bring Moses to the promised land that he expected, but it would bring him to the promised land that really mattered, the promised land of heaven. You see, This was, I mean, a pretty significant moment, but it wasn't the end. Because ultimately, what God is most interested in is that that trust, that relationship, would remain intact. That's exactly how God treated Moses. That's exactly how God treats us. That God's top priority for our lives is that we would remain in a relationship with him. That we would remain trusting of him. Because again, trust is everything for a relationship. You know this, especially if you've had someone that you once trusted, but they broke your trust. It's hard. It's terrible. And and you want to do anything you can to avoid it. And you definitely want to do anything you can to avoid breaking someone's trust. You see, that's what God wanted. That's what God cared about more than anything was that the trust that they shared would not be compromised, even if it meant that Moses would not be able to retire in the promised land. And the same thing is true for us. That yes, will God keep things from us? Will he sometimes take things away if we are not in a place where we are ready to trust him? And if having that things means that we will trust him less? Yeah, God may take things away. He he might discipline us. But we know and we can trust 
that he does it not to punish us, but to correct us and to show his commitment to us. So that's the first thing that God does when our faith falters, when our trust wavers, that he responds with discipline. He responds with love. And the second thing that God does is that he still provides for us. That when we don't trust him, when we disobey him, God still provides for us. And this, this is absolutely clear in the story for today. Because again, Moses did not follow the directions. He did not do everything he was supposed to do. He hits the rock instead of speaking to the rock. But did that keep the rock from providing the water that they needed? No. That even when Moses didn't do everything right, and even when his distrust of God kind of could have made a mess of things, God still provided. And I think this is something that we all need to hear right now because, again, right now we are in a time when I think making mistakes has never been easier. And there's so many complicated situations and so many high stress moments where it's really easy to kind of lose your cool and not be thinking straight and not follow everything that you should do. But we can really take comfort in knowing that no matter what mistakes we make, especially if we are leaders of something and we're responsible for people, that even through our mistakes, God will still provide. And he'll provide for us and for the people around us. That was good news for Moses because, again, the rest of his life was going to be spent in that wilderness. So it was so important for him to know that even when mistakes would come, and even though he was stuck in this wilderness, God would still provide for him that Moses actually had everything that he needed because he had the rock which flowed with streams of water. The same is true for us. In our lives, we will very often be stuck in the wilderness. And yes, we know that there is an eternal promised land waiting for us. But for now, here we are wandering. So it's so crucial, it's so important that we remember and that we know and that we trust that God will still provide for us and that he'll give us everything we need and that he even gives us a rock, a rock that flows with streams of living water. The theologian Tim Keller puts it like this, Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. For all the wilderness times and moments of life, we know and we can trust that there is a rock that accompanies us. And that for all the times that we are thirsty and that our souls are drying up, we know that we are invited to do the same thing that Moses was invited to do, to speak to the rock to pray to the rock, to ask the rock to provide us with everything that we need. And we can know and we can trust that from the rock will flow waters of eternal life. From the rock will flow everything that we need for this life in the wilderness. Let's pray. Dear God, we know that We do not always follow your commands. We know that we do not always obey you. And if we're honest, deep down, oftentimes we are not trusting you like we should. But God, we thank you that you do not leave us and let our faith come to nothing, but that you restore our trust in you by providing everything that we need and by showing us the way that we should go. So please, Lord, in this time, continue to do that for us. We ask this 
in Jesus' name, amen. And now may the Lord bless and keep you, may he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you, may he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave from wherever you are, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Amen.